Harsha, when we spoke about the old nature of exports, we also have something else which has been spoken a lot since November 2015 in the financial services sphere, the, the so-called Colombo International Financial Center. Uh, given that we have two extremes in Dubai and Singapore, where those two nations have positioned those cities for the same purpose, is there a USP for CIFC in Sri Lanka? And, and uh, is, this, is there something which you have to say in terms of the rollout in the next uh, year or so? Yesterday, we had a two-hour discussion with the Prime Minister on this uh, topic. We met with consultants who have been working with us for, I guess, almost a year over the weekend. And um, it's quite apt that you ask me this question today. <laughs> there have been 106 or so attempts at creating financial cities around the world. And uh, you can count on your fingers how many have succeeded. Countries like Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, they are in totality financial centers. Then you have things like Dubai, DIFC, Qatar, FC, others, who are actually financial centers within countries. And the, the models are quite different. Now, I spoke about the hinterland. You know, who are we supposed to serve? The financial needs of uh, India, southern India. Gujarat also has a financial center, but it's called Gujarat Financial Center. It's not an international financial center. Then we have Pakistan, Bangladesh. Don't forget these are large countries and becoming middle-income countries. And the requirement for global financial transactions become much greater. So you can sort of visualize a uh, market for a regional financial center in Colombo. However, is that sufficient for us to create these 600 acres of real estate into a bustling city that we want it to become? Iran talked about decisions made prior to us. We've inherited certain things, and what do we do with it? I'm not going to categorize it into whether it should have been done or not. But as policymakers, we must understand this is what we have. How do we make the best out of it? So I think that the financial component of the new 600 acres piece of real estate is going to be quite small. And in fact, the kind of things that we are unable to do right now because of the policy issues, the, 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 the studying the, the, the Frisbee's angle has still not really sort of come back to us. We need to adapt with what's going on. And I completely agree with what Sanjeev said. So what is the emerging need? And will the banks in the way in which banks operate today, will they operate in 10 years' time? Right? With cryptocurrency and blockchain and all of that in the horizon. And mobile phones becoming banks. And asset managers doing their job sitting in some building somewhere. And artificial intelligence becoming the, the driver. To what extent? Will a financial city be the need for this country or this region in the next 15, 20, 25 years? So I think we have understood that it is bigger than that. So I don't want to say exactly what we may call it, but it is certainly going to be, a, be more than a financial city. We want was it Indrajit who was talking about foreigners investing in the stock market, foreigners coming in and buying bonds, 
What about the Sri Lankans? Big corporates with addresses in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in Dubai, and in London. Can we create the culture, can we create the environment for them to set up and operate from the new entity? What are the kinds of policy changes that we need to do to ensure that happens? So now, one of my responsibilities is to lead this effort. So under the Prime Minister, we're just setting up a new steering committee, which I will chair. And then we will have different people. I want to set up working groups for tax, for real estate, for regulatory, for governance, for risk, and then hopefully we will understand what exactly the market demand is for to create the kind of entities that we want here beyond finance. Right? And just to end, there will be both regulated and non-regulated industries. For regulated industries, what will be the, the governance, the tax, the regulatory environment? For the non-regulated industries, what is it that we can offer? So all this, I think, will become clearer as we proceed. And if you ask for timeline, we have about 45% of the reclamation now complete. Uh, by in about another year's time, we will be ready. Uh, I saw the project company people also in the audience ready to uh, start piling for the first, first buildings. Uh, the, the marina hopefully will be, you know, coming online soon. So there's a whole lot of things and, and with time in the next weeks and months, we will uh, make the, the business community aware of exactly uh, where the opportunities lie. Turning on to you, uh, I think Iran, in your commentary, you alluded to the fact that um, it's, it's nervous to uh, look at transformation without proper research and data. But I'd like to uh, point out something with uh, Sanjeev on what happened on November 8th of last year, when I think Prime Minister Modi shocked uh, the nation by literally within uh, a span of two hours uh, made 86% of the currency in circulation non-legal tender. Uh, in terms of being one of his advisors, uh, was there research and data going behind this particular shock doctrine? And after eight months, do you see that having uh, uh, shaped the sort of transformation which was indented? Sure. Um, I, of course, joined after the uh, uh, thing was implemented, but nevertheless, um, I think you need to see this in the wider context of what Prime Minister Modi is attempting to do. This is, if you see it in isolation, then it's about bringing cash black money out and narrowly trying to fix that. But in fact, what Prime Minister Modi is attempting to do is a much broader transformation of the culture of India. Uh, and this has to be seen in the context of now the GST, um, the much wider effort to bring uh, the corruption levels down, the collusive uh, linkages in the uh, old elite, uh, both political and business, uh, and so on, and try and create a much more fluid um, uh, 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 rule-oriented business culture in India. So I think that is the context in which you need to uh, take this. This specific activity of the demonetization uh, was just one peg in the wider uh, arena. And I think it was a very, very important step in uh, sort of jolting the system into a new uh, path. Um, I'll again use a Singaporean example just because we are on it anyway. If you go back to Singapore in the 1960s and 70s, Singapore was also a poor, crime-ridden, communally sensitive city. Now this is the context in which Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew at that time had introduced draconian municipal uh, fines. You know, you can't spit, you can't chew gum, all kinds of things. Now why did he do it? Is, was it the case that he was 
trying to clean up the city, which he was of course trying to do. But the real intention was simply to impose a sense of order, a change of culture, a signaling that the old ways of doing things was no longer applicable. So this is the context in which you need to see Prime Minister Modi's demonetization. This was a clear signal that the old ways of doing things no longer apply. He had already, as you may be aware, significantly changed the culture of doing business in India. It's high level corruption particularly has, has I think everybody will agree that uh, has come off very, very dramatically. But now what he was signaling to the wider population that this is a change of trajectory. Uh, so quite apart from the very immediate business of bringing out hoarded black money in the system, it was a shock signal to the wider economy that look, we have changed track. And just uh, one final question, this is to do with uh, inclusion. Again, I guess uh, the government of India as way back as 2009 established the unique identification authority and created the other system and the card uh, and in a sense it, it uh, really included the entire population in terms of access to medical care as well as basic access to finance. I know in our own Sri Lanka we have, uh, I believe, made some policy initiatives to do this about an announcement about two years ago. Perhaps this question is to maybe Iran. Uh, what have the challenges been in trying to uh, get this 16-digit thing, or maybe Harsha, this 16-digit uh, UID uh, operationalized? Now it's been about two years since this announcement has been made. I can tell you that it's, it's on track. It's been stuck for, like you said, about um, 18 months because of some procurement issues. But all I can say is we did uh, visit Adar uh, two weeks ago. We met with the CEO, Dr. Pandey. We had a long discussion. And we made some significant changes to how we need to look at uh, the entire project. So um, that's all I can say at the moment. Uh, but uh, I believe in the very near term, uh, you will see how the restructured uh, uh, project uh, will be announced and hopefully very quickly we'll be able to uh, have everyone connected. Uh, the Aadhaar already has got about 1.2 billion people enrolled uh, and it is not that difficult uh, to get our 20 million enrolled. Thank you. Thank you, Harsha. So that, I guess, uh, brings this opening session to a conclusion. And while thanking all the uh, panelists and the speakers for their time and effort,